can sing Emmanuel, that you are here, that you are among us, that you go before us, seeking to give us a peace and a hope that passes all human understanding. And so in this hour, Emmanuel, God be with us as we prepare to celebrate your coming in Jesus Christ. Amen. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Creator and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. There are words and phrases that when we hear them, they just strike memories in our mind. So I'm going to ask you, what comes to mind when you hear the phrase, you best behave? Ever heard it? <laughs> well, maybe not lately, unless you've been to the doctor, you know. <laughs> but on the other hand, I remember as a youngster, you best behave. That meant you best respect others. You best be attentive in the classroom and be on your best behavior in church. In our gospel lesson, we also have some very familiar words that can get our attention. We hear them every year, and yet the question is, how do we hear them? How do we understand them? And how might we live into them? Those familiar words of John the Baptist, of which you could say as best as I, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare, make straight the way of the Lord. Familiar words. However, have you ever thought, as John, it says, was the voice of one crying in the wilderness, have you ever thought, why was John in the desert wilderness in the first place? Who would want to go into that kind of place? After all, most often when we hear the word wilderness, it is often thought as, oh, could be a place of danger or a place of adventure, potential uncertainty. Scripturally, when we hear of wilderness, we might think of Jesus after he was baptized in the River Jordan. Scripture tells us that the Spirit led him where? To the wilderness where he was tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. Well, personally, when I hear the word wilderness, I often think of, you know, many years ago, taking young people to the boundary waters of northern Minnesota, of which I have mentioned previously in years past. But there, a guide would tell us every year during our orientation, as we were preparing to go in the wilderness, and I just love this quote, he said, if you are not prepared, the wilderness will always win. Again, wilderness. It may mean adventure. And oh yes, adventures can be rich and fulfilling and enhancing to our life and our spirit. Like I think I have on <coughs> my bucket list an adventure, a, what might be a wilderness place, of a raft trip on the Colorado River. I mean, I think that could be fun. Could be dangerous too. Or, <coughs> excuse me, there are misdirected adventures that can take us down a path. misdirected adventures that can take us down a path toward a life that unravels. That unravels our focus, our spirit, our morality, our integrity, <coughs> our futures. <coughs> and many have been there. But on the other hand, and this is a huge <coughs> on the other hand, can a wilderness place be a place of renewal? Can a wilderness place be a place of renewal? Think of this on this third Sunday in Advent. How are you holding up? How are your credit cards holding up? <laughs> ah, it can be a time of adventure <coughs> and of wilderness. And oh yes, there are during these times ho-hum moments, there are moments that we are unnerved. There are moments when our mind is full or cluttered with memories or expectations. Or maybe, maybe simply a holy emptiness as to what's it all about anyway. For many during these weeks, we reflect over the past year of life. Circumstances. And we think of what has changed. And as we do that, we are reminded of the strong truth. The relationships and health and hopes and fears are in a constant flux of change. And therefore, are we at times finding ourselves in a weary world of adventure? In a weary world of uncertainty rather than in a weary world of rejoicing? Yes, such could be termed personal.
personal wilderness places. But John the Baptist turns the table on our common definition of wilderness. For John the Baptist, you see, wilderness was not a place of uncertainty or fear, but quite the opposite. For you see, prophets in the day of John would enter the wilderness to seek out a place of calm and certainty and serenity. Calm and serenity away from, have you ever wished, to get away from the economic and political and peer pressures of the day. That's why he went in the wilderness. For John, the wilderness was a place apart, a place for reflection and prayer to then enter back into the challenges of life and faith, strengthened by that wilderness time to go out and do what needed to be done, prepare the way of the Lord. That's what needed to be done. In other words, in that wilderness place for John, it was a holy place and not a hectic place. So the question might be, in the context of John's experience in the wilderness as a spiritual place for building up of courage and confidence and faith, ought we also, ought we also claim or seek out a, quote, place apart, that different kind of wilderness, a wilderness, a place apart for prayer, seeking out holy clarity and holy wisdom and spiritual insight and courage and boldness in order that we can enter back into the life that God has created for us rather than that the cultural, cultural dumps on us. Reality says to us, does it not, as we are so enmeshed in our personal agendas, as we are so enmeshed in living into the expectation of others, as we are so enmeshed in this wilderness that yes, there can be a wilderness tug of war going on between the secular and the sacred. After all, there is so much out there, is there not? And what does life do around us? But day to day, it competes, it complicates, it confuses us, and yet into that complexity of life, oh, I love that second lesson, into our complexity of life, Paul in his letter to the church of Thessalonica says, and this is a great admonition, he says, do not quench the spirit, the spirit of God that is within you. Do not quench it. Hold fast to what is good. Despise what is evil, what is darkness, what draws you away from God. Despise it. However, and let, it, let us be clear, do not allow all that is around us, that cultural wilderness, do not allow it to defeat you. Because you and I and we are children of God. Baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are a child of God and therefore do not quench, diminish, or demean that spark of the divine that is within you. Such admonition, however, is a tough call, isn't it? At times resulting in a spiritual tug of war, a tug of our conscience, pulling us, twisting us, tempting us, causing the potential of creating a wilderness of chaos in our mind, then quenching the spirit, even to the point of which I have heard it said, as many of you may have also, well, Pastor, I just can't wait to get past Christmas. I'm worn out. <laughs> As if to say, December 26th, the bubble will burst and expectations and demands of life will become less. If that is the case, if that's what our spirit says, then our spirit has been, has it been quenched? Has it been pushed down and pushed away? Has that little light of yours, as we sing, this little light of mine, during these weeks of busyness and what have you, has that light become a flicker rather than a flame of hope and joy and peace of the season? Into all of this complexity, is change and renewal possible? How do we get on that straight path to the Lord? Consider this, and I know there are some who have trouble with the old ways 
with the old traditions, but I know there are many that embrace it. Yes, could tradition be that wilderness place? Could tradition be that different kind of wilderness place where we discover and renew our spirit during these times? Could the traditions of Advent and Christmas be that wilderness place where renewal and insight and hope is found away from the pressures of our culture. After all, in a world of change and uncertainty, we need to be reminded, yes, traditionally and biblically and as the people of God, we need to be reminded where two or three are gathered. Here am I in the midst of them. Here, tradition, in this place, do we appreciate, think about it, do we appreciate hearing the same scripture and the same stories year after year? Is there a grounding for us in hearing all of those? Do we come into this place away from the secular into the sanctuary of sacredness? Do we come here wanting to see the familiar lights and decorations? I know you do. And you keep asking, when are the lights on the trees going to go on? It's tradition, right? You expect it. It's meaningful to you. We want to sing in this place, do we not? Familiar hymns and carols. It is here in the traditional way we want to remember those who are no longer with us. Who are no longer sitting next to us in the pew or around us at the table. That's tradition. It's meaningful to us. It gives us a sense of certainty. Or in our homes. Oh, during this time of year, we want to have the same familiar favorite foods, don't we? Oh, do you have a traditional Christmas meal that's meaningful for you? A few years, oh, many years ago now, we were all sitting around the Christmas table. It's wonderful, the family was there. And we were having our traditional meal, which included lunafisk. If you don't know what it is, don't worry about it. We were having lunafisk. And so Sarah said to her oldest daughter, Carola, she said, are you going to carry on the tradition of lunafisk? And she said, no, Mom, it dies here. Well, maybe some things that's okay. <laughs> but tradition, it says we want to receive Christmas cards and decorate our homes and bake the same cookies. And so I say, no, we best not quench the spirit, either of tradition or of renewal. For it is in the integration of those old traditions and in the changing expressions that we live to each day where there is a sense of vitality and spirit for life, is it not? And so I think of this. Our youngest daughter said a month or so ago, you know, Dad, we haven't been together for Christmas in over 10 years now. And in hearing that remark, I kind of took that personally, and I was sad. And yet knowing that now, in the now, that they will be coming here on Friday, my heart and spirit was, is filled with joy and anticipation. Oh my. A truth of faith and life is this. We are continually entering into times of preparation and anticipation. And yet thanks be to God that during these weeks we hear that familiar traditional story of Jesus. And even though our lives are constantly changing, the Spirit of God, Emmanuel, God with us, meets us at that intersection of faith and life, seeking to calm our spirits from anxiety and fear and hopelessness. And that Spirit says to us, Peace peace. And therefore this week, I know, it may be busy. Many of you may go to Costco. Busy place. <laughs> Hot dogs are good though. You may go to Costco. You may go to the mall. You may spend time on Amazon. You may go to a concert or a gathering to attend. And we may say that yes, we are busy and we are a bit weary. But I say, Time out. Pause. Step into your different, into your different holy wilderness place, wherever that may be. A place apart 
to make your path straight to Bethlehem, which leads us in the way and into the presence of God. For it is the way of peace and joy and a future of hope. May we discover and be renewed in this different kind of wilderness as we make God's path straight. Amen.